resume our hearing um, and we have Rutland presenting their budget next and they'll also be speaking to the um, enforcement letter sent from the board. Um, can each of you please raise your hand and I'll administer the oath. Um, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I got one, I do. I think part of the problem um, is that we have one mic in the room. Um, and so if you're just seeing one of the particular panels light up, that being Jennifer Bertrand, um, it's it's not indicative just of Jen. Um, so oh, I understand that, but I only heard one voice. So uh, however you'd like to proceed, um, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, so I heard Ms. Bertrand. Uh, Ms. Fox, do you? I do. Um, Mr. Baruti. I do. And Ms. Watson. I do. I do. Great. Um, it's 2.55, so we're starting a little late. We're going to try and do about 45 minutes for the presentation. We can add a couple minutes, but we'll target for a 3.40 um, conclusion of the presentation. If you need a couple more minutes, that's fine. Um, so I'll turn it to you for the presentation, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board and the Healthcare Advocate team for taking the time to understand the rut rate and the budget that we've worked hard to put together. Uh, we've worked hard to balance cost, access, quality, and affordability. Uh, I was going to take the time to introduce our team, uh, but I will forego that uh, given that we just found that. Um, so in terms of today's presentation, really trying to keep to a tight agenda, I'll keep my introduction short to, to allow Jennifer time to review the details of the budget. Um, but know that our budget narrative and presentation really mirrors that narrative that we provided to the board in early July. Just a little background on Rutland. Uh, so uh, um, we are a, a critical community partner uh, here in, in our um, in, in Rutland County, providing both essential access to health care, but also serving as the largest employer in our region. We take this responsibility seriously. Uh, we provide care for 60,000 people in our community. Um, and for some services, uh, you'll see that we care for patients well beyond the Rutland region. Uh, and Jennifer is actually going to review that with you as part of her detailed uh, budget overview. We continue to see demand for healthcare services and it's really striving to support patients and receiving care. Um, in the right setting with the right providers. Uh, to that end, uh, we do treat about 34,000 ED patients. We perform 5,100 surgeries, care for 6,300 inpatients, and provide testing, diagnostic, and ancillary care for more than 275,000 patients. Um, and we employ over 1,800 employees, including 76 physicians and 49 advanced practice providers. We have credentialed over 325 medical staff uh, who represent 43 different specialties. And I'm humbled to say uh, we, are, we have a committed and dedicated um, volunteer team who provide more than 30,000 hours of support uh, to uh, our staff and community, really indicative of that community support uh, that we are so fortunate to have here in Rutland. In terms of our services, we are the second largest hospital in the state. And as uh, in that position, we have a broad range of services. We really strive to attain centers of excellence for all of our service lines. Um, it is important to note, and I would ask that as the Green Mountain Care Board considers benchmarks and costs that you take into consideration services that are provided. For instance, our medical and radiation oncology services drive significant pharmaceutical costs, and our inpatient acute physiatry program drives long length of stay, both of which serve to drive, drive our cost per district adjusted discharge costs. Excuse me. It's also important to note that we don't employ primary care. 
Most of our primary care services are organized within our community in an FQHC structure and are further supported by a few private primary care practices uh, surrounding and uh, included in the region. Moving on to recognition and quality, we're proud to, uh, of our recognition and, quality and commitment to quality. Our long-standing recognition in orthopedics, a long history of being a magnet organization, and the recognition to patient safety all demonstrate our dedication to quality. But we know there's always more. We know we have a responsibility to our community to continue to improve. We remain committed to quality as is demonstrated in our strategic plan. Our 2024 strategic plan prioritizes a focus on optimizing quality care delivery, advancing our culture of safety, and improving health equity. The plan provides specific measurable outcomes to help us achieve our goals as we continue to meet the needs of our patients and the community we serve. With the highest level of those goals noted as regaining our five-star rating and attaining redesignation of our magnet program. Over the past year, our mission and vision has been restated to reflect today's healthcare environment and the call to action for Rutland. Our mission uh, is to provide high quality hospital and specialty care for all through the strength and compassion of our people and our vision to excel at meeting the needs of those we serve as the preferred healthcare provider and employer. Both serve to guide our strategic plan, our values, excellence, professionalism, innovation, collaboration, and compassion have also been modernized and reflect Rutland's desire to become an employer of choice, building an employee experience that will allow us to continue to recruit and retain valued employees. We've made some progress from our most dire states where we had 200 vacancies and are now seeking about 151 employees. Our values will serve as the foundation for selecting and retaining our staff, which allows us to continue to promote. In terms of our strategic plan, we've worked diligently and deliberately over the past year to develop an aspirational multi-year strategic plan that focuses our work and links to specific these goals, employer choice, access to care, quality care, financial stewardship, and transformation are not mutually exclusive. Rather, are independent and require broad commitment and success. The strategic plan serves as the roadmap to allow Rutland to continue to be focused and disciplined in healthcare transformation. As far as our plan goes, our plan is a balanced approach that includes five strategies, 12 objectives, 13 high-level metrics, and hundreds of me metrics that we refer to as success measures that track our progress in a more detailed fashion. A lot of detail here. Certainly happy had to take any questions later in this presentation or any follow-up too. Uh, this leads to transformation. Uh, we agree that the current trajectory of healthcare is not sustainable. Care delivery needs to be transformed Infrastructure needs to be built. Today, Rutland loses $39 million from state and federal payers, meaning our cost to care is $39 million more than our reimbursement we receive. And our community is aging. In the next five years, the Rutland community is projected to lose 12% of its working class. We have the perfect storm, an aging community, increased demand for access, deterioration of our payer mix, resulting in fewer commercially insured patients, an aging plan, and a highly competitive market for our workforce. We pledge our commitment to support and collaborate as Vermont seeks innovative approaches that result in better access, higher quality, and lower costs. In terms of Act 167, we appreciate the work that Oliver Wyman, AHS, and the Green Mountain Care Board has taken on. As, all, as outlined by Oliver Wyman, Rutland is positioned to grow and provide services that currently have long wait times or travel requirements. <clears throat> Opportunities identified included 
capturing both inpatient and outpatient services, including obstetrics, cardiology, general surgery, pulmonary, and building more access to services such as orthopedics, eye care, primary care, inpatient dialysis, and ICU level care. While at the same time, we know we must continue to be committed to realizing efficiencies and cost savings. As for the Oliver Wyman potential recommendations, some initiatives have been identified in our strategic plan, while others will require more evaluation. We must engage with the state, federal, and community healthcare partners to determine how best to meet the needs and challenges that have been identified. And I'll end with collaboration. True transformation and improvement in care delivery will take all of us across the state. Green Mountain Care Board, Agency of Human Services, state government, partner hospitals, our payers, our primary care networks, our designated agencies, and our critical community partners. As was discussed throughout yesterday's Green Mountain Care Board meeting, the need for Vermont hospitals to live on our Medicare margins is becoming increasingly more important. This goal will require all partners to reach success. Hospitals need to continue to find efficiencies and open up vital access. State infrastructure needs to continue to be provided to support post-acute care. For Rutland, this issue alone cost us over $6 million a year and definitely <laughs> is part of that $39 million loss in our Medicare and Medicaid program. We need to continue to recruit primary care providers and those uh, recruitment needs to be funded to, to mitigate care that is being provided in emergency rooms and that could and should be delivered in primary care offices. And lastly, funding for mental health and home health agencies needs to be considered to promote access to essential services in a cost-effective manner, meaning not in a hospital. Governance and regulatory policies need to be streamlined Policies need to consider ways to mitigate administrative overhead, and governance, funding, and regulation must continue to serve as the foundation to promote safe and timely access to care across our state. Rutland stands committed to support these initiatives. So now I'd like to hand it over to Jen Bertrand, who can walk uh, you through the, the details of our 2025 budget. Good afternoon, members of the board, uh, Green Mountain Care Board staff, and the HCA team. We're Certainly appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you today regarding our proposed FY 2025 budget. So to begin the financial portion of our presentation, we wanted to summarize our request and highlight that Rutland is meeting two of the three benchmarks that were set forth. Those two benchmarks being the commercial rate growth as well as the operating margin benchmark. RMC is exceeding the net revenue benchmark by 2.6% due to improvements in access to care. And I'll discuss this uh, in a bit more detail further on in the presentation. Our 25 budget does incorporate the balance of several objectives. Uh, one was to increase the availability of services and certainly improve access to care. The other to reduce wait times, and that's particularly in imaging and higher demand specialty care services, and I'll talk about that a little bit further on. Uh, we wanted to create a budget that does consider patient affordability, one that does incorporate initiatives aimed at reducing costs, one that is focusing on continued operational efficiency, and we needed to factor in the potential outcome of our upcoming uh, union negotiation. Another objective was we needed to raise the organizational minimum wage. And then lastly, as our final objective, attain a moderate operating margin. Our 25 budget does certainly include some level of risk. I'm not gonna go through all of those that you see on the slide there, but I did wanna call out and highlight a few. Um, and as you've heard others say, and you're going to hear this, uh, you know, more as hearings continue on, that we continue to face workforce challenges in healthcare. Recruitment and retention efforts are certainly challenged by inflationary pressures, and of course, that lends to wage compression, and then the workforce availability. That's one of the biggest impacts on our workforce. And that always is an issue when you're trying to strike that balance between financial stewardship 
and of course, adequately supporting the needs of our workforce. We've been prioritizing initiatives focused on recruitment and, in, and retention, and we continue to val, uh, develop talent pipeline support. And just as a, an example, we've added a clinical instructor position for our imaging um, areas. Attracting technologists has been increasingly challenging, and it's really been more so since the college that we had uh, in our area closed a few years ago. Posing an inherent risk to our budget is our upcoming labor negotiation. We did incorporate an increase in nursing labor expense into our budget. However, with the evolving landscape um, and the competitive market, that may necessitate some further adjustments beyond what we had initially planned in this budget. Another risk within our budget is further erosion of the 340B program. We have a specific slide on this and I'll touch on that a little bit more later on. But the continued impact of uh, the manufacturer constraints on the program has really reduced that revenue that we've been relying upon. So we've had to make sure that we're actively engaging our state and federal partners in order to communicate the benefits of the 340B program. And lastly, any unanticipated loss of a provider in our organization can have a significant impact. So to ensure that we do not compromise on access to care, we do leverage um, reliance on locums and per diem coverage to address any of those vacancies, just knowing that that does come at a higher cost. To counterbalance the risks, I do wanna highlight some opportunities that RMC has recognized. One is an observation by Dr. Hamry that RMC is well positioned to provide our range of specialty and hospital-based services to neighboring communities. And frankly, we've been experiencing a rise in demand for uh, services from patients outside of our health service area. And again, I'll touch on that in a little bit in the next slide. One area of opportunity for us is technology solutions and leveraging those to be able to enhance efficiency, streamline processes, and really reduce manual efforts, which will obviously uh, provide some cost savings. Right now, we're currently evaluating some solutions within our supply chain area that we anticipate will accomplish just that. As it relates to workforce efficiency, we recognize it's important to explore innovative approaches to workforce allocation, and that includes expanding and enhancing internal resources for nursing and ancillary staff, being able to facilitate cross-departmental training for comparative job roles is another way of doing this. And really, we've been continuing to mature our position control process, as well as leveraging our labor benchmarking tools. And with regard to cost-sharing initiatives, sharing provider time and salary with other facilities is certainly an area to expand. Uh, cooperative purchasing agreements is another and leveraging cost sharing just to receive that highest tiered pricing with some of our vendors is another example. And then lastly is resource optimization and continuous process improvement. We are constantly identifying and optimizing processes that utilize manual intervention and trying to automate those processes and really incorporating a recurring strategy to evaluate and implement evolving best practices, because they do change every few years, um, and improving processes, that's really a sound practice. And as I mentioned, just um, experiencing an increase in patients from outside our HSA seeking services. So just wanted to highlight that those services do include orthopedics, inpatient care, oncology, as well as emergency services. And it's also worth noting that in our imaging services, especially um, CT, that's also being sought after. And where are those patients coming from? Primarily those patients are coming from Windsor County, from Bennington, as well as Addison County, in addition to that. Just a quick note, as the slide advances here, on our 2024 projection, um, we've been experiencing an increase in utilization in FY 2024 that's going to carry forward into our FY 25 budget. In February of 24, we did open an expanded infusion center. We created a new, more comfortable space and improved the patient experience, and we added four additional infusion stations at that time. 
That expansion was really the result of rising demand for infusion services within our HSA. Um, and in May of 2024, RMC brought online a second CT scanner so that we could increase access so that we were meeting patient demand for that service, not only within our health service area, as you heard me mention, but also outside of our HSA. So with those services coming online and with the increased demand for surgical services that we've been seeing, we are projecting that our net revenue will exceed budgeted expectation by about 2.5%. Um, and when our 25 budget was formulated, we did use our 2024 projected uh, performance as the basis for our 2025 budget. To touch on net revenue, and we'll spend a bit of time here, um, our RMC's net revenue budget Thank does you, Ms. yield- Ms. Bertrand, can I, can, I, can I interrupt for a second? Certainly. Can you go back? I, I wanna make sure I understood that. Um, the last slide. You said, I'm sorry to interrupt this. No, it's okay. I want to make sure I understood it right. Um, you said the 25 budget is going to be, you're expecting to be 2.5% over, over what? It's the 24 projected revenue is projected to be over budgeted expectations by 2.5%. 24 projected is going to be, two, okay. Yes. And then this budget is built off of incorporating that overage. Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. And we certainly, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more because we are layering on other new services as well um, in the 25 budget. Uh, as for revenue, it does yield a 6.1% increase over the 24 budget, recognizing that this is one of um, the Gray Mountain Care Board's benchmarks that Rutland has not met. I do want to draw attention to the chart, however, on the right, that does provide a categorization of the sources driving that net revenue increase. And you can see that of that 6.1%, 4.3% of that is the revol result of increased utilization and really improving access to care. And I want to mention that originally these calculations that we have on this slide did match those that we reviewed um, with staff for the Green Mountain Care Board. However, in yesterday's presentation, the numbers were a bit off. So um, Elena, I certainly welcome working with you and the team just to uh, ensure we're working from all the same numbers. And in the next slide, I just wanna to touch on some areas of focus that we're improving access to care to meet those increasing demands of our patients. Next slide, please. Go. The access to care initiatives that we introduced in 2024, which was that infusion expansion as well as the second CT, that's going to now have a full year impact in FY 2025. And additionally, this is where the layering comes on a little bit, we are going to acquire a mobile MRI unit so that we can reduce wait times in that particular service line and be able to meet patient demand. Also, due to some demand that we've seen for sur surgical services, particularly, um, as you've heard me mention, in orthopedics, not just in our HSA, but again, outside of our HSA, we are adding five additional OR days per month to our surgical schedule. That additional time will accommodate not just that increase that we're seeing um, in current demand, but will accommodate the new surgical providers that are joining us this fall. Other noteworthy utilization changes do include that list that you see there on the slide. Um, and I want to mention that endoscopy services also is another area that we are hyper focused on addressing uh, wait times as bit of, uh, as well as we have a bit of a backlog in endoscopy as well. So it's one other area I wanted to mention. You certainly heard us uh, draw attention to uh, the persistent challenge that we have pertaining to our custodial patient population that we care for. And I just want to highlight a few things here. Um, and just as a reminder, those, of course, are patients awaiting placement in a more suitable care setting. But for our FY 2025 budget, we are anticipating that about 8.4% um, of patient activity is going to be allocated to caring for those patients. And as a reminder, that's very little or no reimbursement for those patients. Right now, we carry, uh, excuse me, care on average per day for six to eight uh, custodial patients. 
which is kind of limiting our ability to accept acute care patients. And the cost of caring for those patients is about $6.2 million. Right now, in-house, we are caring for about three custodial patients, and they've actually been with us for over six months. And honestly, those patients certainly deserve to be in a more enriching environment than a hospital, but it's certainly challenging to find them placement. Our case management team has been working very hard and very diligently um, with our community partners to try to place these patients in a more appropriate care setting. Um, but frankly, long-term care bed availability is, is a challenge. As part of our budget, uh, budget guidance, we were asked to justify any of the benchmarks we were not meeting. And of course, we acknowledge that we were not meeting uh, the three and a half percent net revenue threshold. This is in part to three items. The first are the utilization impacts that I mentioned uh, early on, that our objective is to improve access to care primarily in CT, MRI, infusion, and surgical services. The second is the goal of reducing wait times, particularly in imaging with CT and MRI, and also with uh, endoscopy, our sleep medicine, as well as cardiology. And I'll talk about that in a moment in a couple of slides as to actually putting some real goals to those wait times. The third item um, that's contributing to our increase in NPR is us incorporating the impact of those patients seeking care from outside of our HSA. And again, I'll touch on that as to what's happening in the 25 budget in a moment. But as you can see from the chart on the slide, of that $20 million in net revenue increase, 70% of that increase is coming from utilization. And I just wanted to highlight that. And again, just caring for patients across the state um, where they are coming to Rutland from other areas. On the slide, you can see the number of the encounters through June that we're tracking. That's on the heat map there on the right-hand side. In the 25 budget, we have incorporated the increase we're seeing in the service lines that I talked about prior. But one other service line that I wanted to highlight that's really risen to our top five um, that's on the list now for 2024, and we've incorporated into our 25 budget, is patients outside of our HSA are utilizing our inpatient psychiatric care services. And this is the first time that we have seen that service rising to you know, our top five or six services with that particular subset of patients from outside of our HSA. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're setting some measurable targets here so that we can decrease wait times. Just a couple of examples on the slide, um, but with imaging services in particular, CT, we do need to be more in line with some of our other imaging services, uh, X-ray, ultrasound, general diagnostic imaging, and we are not with CT, which is why we brought a second CT on. We really wanna be able to target 50% of visits being scheduled within the first two weeks. Um, another area you heard me mention earlier that's not on the slide is endoscopy. That's another significant area of focus for us. We're targeting 40% within two weeks, and right now endoscopy is of around 22.5%. So we have some work to do there, um, and we've certainly put those targets uh, forward for 2025. Um, now, some of the endoscopy, I will say, is provider dependent, but our team is working very diligently to make sure that we're uh, filling those provider open openings um, so that we can address the wait times for endoscopy. And we do have a backlog, as I mentioned earlier. For high demand specialty services, as you heard me mention, sleep studies, um, as well as cardiology, um, you can see on the slide with cardiology, we really want to target 45% within two weeks. That would be more in line with the wait times for some of our other specialty services. And we are behind the curve bit, a bit on cardiology. So we're shifting our focus uh, on that particular specialty in FY25 as well. Just want to touch on our charge increase our budget does incorporate a 3.4% increase to our inpatient outpatient, outpatient charges. Um, we are not applying a charge increase to our professional services. And although we all recognize that patient affordability is, is a relative concept, it hasn't been defined yet, um, but we felt that our pricing methodology in this year's budget really did take into account patient affordability. 
And then, of course, it does meet the uh, GMCB benchmark. Um, and as you've heard me say in the past, and just to kind of reiterate this again, there is a distinct difference between an increase in price or charge versus how that translates to our commercial rate growth. And I do want to acknowledge the board and the GMCB staff this year for highlighting that in our budget submission um, because we've separated what the true rate impact is from utilization and MEX. Um, but also there's a very distinct difference between the discounted contractual percentage that a payer is contracted to provide versus what we refer to as the effective collection rate or reimbursement that's actually paid to the hospital. That further reduction is really uh, a result of changes in payment policies that are really not able to be negotiated. As it pertains to our commercial rate growth, uh, RMC is below the budgeted benchmark or the GMCB benchmark of 3.4%. Um, we did a little bit of a calculation just to see what the system median and system average was um, with the submitted um, rate decomposition sheets that we had at the time. And you can see what we had calculated there. Um, the commercial rate growth does equate to 1.3% of the total 6.1 that you saw on the slide uh, early on. Our commercial rate increase due to that 3.4% change in charge to in and outpatient service areas is not impacting any commercial payer more than just over 3%. But I wanna be um, respectfully candid if I could that the aggregate approval statements in the budget order, which for RMC would equate to about 2.8%, would be difficult because it's not specific enough. And we have one commercial payer whose rate increase is at 3.05% um, and another that's at 3.01%. And we would just wonder if the budget orders could uh, be at the payer level or encompass the a not to exceed rate, so to speak, of that 3.05%. And I wanna spend a little bit of time on just talking through this next section because I did listen in a bit to the rate review hearings and I feel like there's a, a difference in translated approach to the components of our budget submissions. So as you can see from the chart on the slide, we've specifically outlined um, the impact on each commercial payer by rate, mix, and utilization category. I think the difference in the calculations that the payers are using as to them rate is all encompassing. So for them, it's utilization, it's new or expanded services that we're bringing on, it's payer mix shifts in addition to that rate. Their calculation is the total percent change over the prior year's budget. And for hospitals, when we submit a change in charge of X percent, let's say, not all parties are translating that to the payer's total estimated increase. So when we've spoken to and the way we've associated the rate, if you will, um, it's generally that change in charge or the impact of that change in charge. And from my observation and experience, the payers are focusing on that right-hand column that you see there, that total column, the 13.52, the 15.67, 8.7, et cetera. Um, that's the estimated total amount of the impact to the payers. And when RNC was asked this year by one of our payers uh, for the estimated rate request, we actually provided this breakdown to them. Um, if this level of detail though is maybe not outlined in the budget order, it might continue to create maybe a little bit of confusion between the hospitals and, and the payers. Keeping in mind all of this uh, plays into hospitals exceeding their budgeted net revenue, um, like our RMC, whose utilization and access to care has increased over the past few years, it does create um, a term that I had listened in over rate hearings as, as an overrun. Um, our total claim impact, though, to the commercial payers will obviously be higher, um, which is, in essence, that cost growth that they're experiencing because of those increases. And we all know that you know, we we can't refuse care to patients, and some of our initiatives are involving that improved access to care. And just to highlight that our budget does include $14 million of net revenue so that we can address access to care issues, not only within our HSA, but outside of our HSA, and also includes those new and expanded services I had mentioned. 
I do find it valuable each year um, to tie the proposed commercial rate growth to the inflationary impact that we're experiencing. And so for FY25, RMC's total there on the left, you can see our estimated inflation is 17, uh, excuse me, $7.3 million, um, which equates to about 2 million when you take um, the payer mix for our commercial payers. Um, and any additional reimbursement from government payers or other payers, and you take into account then what we all refer to as the cost shift, you know, and any payer policy impact that we might be experiencing, um, that goes into our calculations. And this year, that additional amount to the payer would have been $4 million. The Medicaid shortfall this year was $1.1 million. Our Medicare shortfall uh, was $1.9 million, and we had the remainder in payer policy change impacts. We understand that that $4 million in totality is a lot to shoulder and really in consideration of, again, patient affordability, we did make the decision to absorb approximately half of that $4 million shift, um, which really equates to about uh, a 1.3% reduction in commercial rate. And that doesn't include the cost saving initiatives that I'll talk about in just a moment. Segwaying just quickly and you know into other categories of the budget, I don't want to spend a lot of time on other re revenue, but it is worth mentioning. You heard me say this in our inherent risks in our budget that 340B is an area that continues to erode. And you can see here on the slide, it's significantly uh, declined since 2021. Um, and we've really had to deliberately focus on improved access to care and in introducing new and expanded services so that we could make up for that shortfall. Uh, just to move on to expenses, um, just quickly on operational efficiency. Um, I touched on some of these in the opportunities section. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but we do focus on finding operational efficiencies where we can. But this we recognize is an ongoing task. This job is never done. Um, and as you heard me mention before, as best practices evolve and tech technology advances, incorporating um, processes um, and improvement strategies is certainly a valuable uh, practice. And the list here on the slide are just some of the few initiatives that we're currently working on to advance those operational efficiencies within the organization. And really, um, one of the highlights of our budget are the cost saving initiatives that we've incorporated. And we have found a total savings of approximately $3.8 million. We have several projects that are contributing to this. Um, the first is we did revise our approach and management of our premium pay structure. Um, and in order to reduce reliance on contract labor, we were able to more effectively leverage some internal resources and optimization of staffing. Um, we're integrating some physical areas within the hospital so that we can gain some operational efficiencies um, and optimize the allocation of staff in those particular areas. We did incorporate some FTE reductions. You'll see that on a slide here in a moment. Um, we did increase what we call our vacancy factor so that it's more in line with our current trend. And then lastly, um, as a result of those cost saving initiatives that we did in 2024, as well as what we've built into our next year's budget, you can see from the chart below, that's having a positive impact on our cost per adjusted discharge. Um, and recognizing that this has been um, an issue for RMC in the past, we've really been diligently trying to work to reduce this over the past couple of years. Next slide, thank you. Uh, our cost saving initiatives certainly not only have an impact on our cost per adjusted discharge, as I just mentioned, but it has an impact on the requests that we brought forward for commercial rates. Over the last two budget cycles, we have saved a total of $8.8 .8 million, not including that 1.3 reduction I just spoke about a couple slides ago um, as a result of us sharing in that cost shift in 2025. We've been able to reduce our commercial rate ask by nearly 6%. If we combine those two things over the last um, two years, it would be a total reduction of 7.2% and approximately $10.7 million. Expenses, we acknowledge expenses are increasing by 5%. 63% of that increase um, is in salary and benefits, 86% of that 63%. 
love the math, but CFOs do, um, is increase in clinical salaries. Other expense budget um, includes uh, 3% COLA that we incorporated. Um, again, we did increase the organizational minimum wage. Our overall benefit expense increase, we incorporated 3%. We did include estimates for our upcoming union negotiation. Um, we did include the employer portion of the uh, child care tax that was implemented. And then we did incorporate an increase of our 403B plan match. We really need to progress toward increased competitiveness in the market. Um, and as you heard me say, recruitment and retention efforts are certainly challenged. Um, and so we did increase that in this year's budget. That obviously has that balancing act and impact on uh, trying to manage between revenue and expense growth. But I think with this budget, we were able to strike that balance. I just wanna quickly highlight a couple of items from the wing and buy exercise we were asked to do as part of our filing. We know uh, that admin in general line on the cost report contains a wide variety of uh, expenses. And frankly, we don't have any other line really to put those on for the cost report in order to be classified correctly. So a large portion of those departments that hit on that line really do go to providing essential support for our patients. And just as quick reference, um, they do include uh, departments like quality and safety, our infection prevention department, case management, our community health team, there's many more, but just to highlight those that have direct patient contact. Um, no matter if we use the wing and buy classification though, or our RMC's defined classification of costs, which was what we were asked to do in the exercise, if you calculate the difference between our latest filed cost report in 23, as you can see on the slide, and compare that to 2019, our admin and general costs have decreased um, by seven and a half percent. And the last three filed cost reports, have they have certainly decreased as well. Um, just lastly for expenses, just wanna quickly touch on that our FTEs are increasing by 11. However, those are related to those initiatives that I had mentioned earlier with some of the things that are listed at the bottom. Um, and then those positions that support recruitment and retention efforts. Um, and I think that wraps it up for the expense section. Next slide, please. I just wanna to quickly touch on our margin and bond covenant compliance. Next slide, please. Uh, our budgeted margin does uh, meet the Gray Mountain Care Board benchmark and that margin will mostly fund the capital needs that support the access and operational efficiency initiatives we've talked about uh, throughout the presentation, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little further when we get to the capital section. Just from a bond covenant perspective, um, just as a reminder, not too long ago, we were in breach of our bond covenants. We've certainly spent the last two years stabilizing the balance sheet and really, um, unfortunately, that recovery has only been achieved through the suppression of capital spending. So on top of the slowdown that everyone was experiencing with COVID, um, that breach really caused an additional slowdown for us here at our RMC. Um, and it impaired our ability to really reinvest back in our capital needs. And as you can see toward the bottom of the chart here, what our age of plant looks like, um, our facilities infrastructure is aging significantly, and we really do need to make some meaningful progress on this. And just to quickly touch on the capital budget, we just showed you here an abridged version of the sources and uses. Um, just to understand where that $9.2 million in margin is going to, um, and go ahead and skip forward for me. And this is just highlighting the uh, high level categories of capital spend and the funding sources. I do wanna note that some of um, the items within those categories are subject to CON approval, but you can see from the sub, uh, funding sources section, um, we're making some significant capital investments in 25. It's going to require us to go to the market for about $7 million um, in debt. And so we have a couple of options available to us. So if going out for a fixed rate loan with our current banking organization or 
um, a local banking institution does not pan out. We can draw on a line of credit, but that comes at a higher interest rate. So we certainly want to leverage um, our relationships with our, our banking institutions so we can get the best rate possible. And I, I should highlight also that um, our capital expenditures over the next three to four years is planned to be funded through operations and not needing to go necessarily to the market for funding. I just wanted to touch on quickly and acknowledge the comparative metrics. Um, the initial comparison of sources has certainly revealed some areas that we feel we could um, look at and consider and um, reach out for some clarification and evaluation. And we, we do customarily use benchmarks to guide our priorities and strategic plans so those can align with our goals. Um, and we've mentioned some of those monitoring the cost per adjusted discharge is one example. But in order for us to really proceed, we'd love to know how um, we could have a more comprehensive understanding of the prioritized metrics and how we might be evaluated on those and consider them as part of our submission. And we certainly appreciate the varying data sources and calculation methods, and we welcome any collaboration with the board members and staff. And I just want to give a couple of examples in the next slide of some of the variability we were seeing in the metrics. Um, the difference between the Bartholomew and Nash analysis, which is focusing on inpatient services only, um, the Colorado analysis, which is really looking at the total hospital and professional services. And it would be really interesting to understand how our custodial patient day volume might be evaluated in, in, in this analysis and how that compares to some of our peers. And then also, and Robin mentioned this yesterday, how the true or the estimated FPP could impact that data as well. And so we just want to be able to internalize and comprehend all those variables and variations so that we can draw some um, accurate, meaningful conclusions from those, but thought that it was very insightful and helpful. And just to wrap up the 25 budget discussion quickly before highlighting our 23 performance, I did want to say that the budget we're proposing is responsible and thoughtful. Uh, it's one that we feel is dedicated to improving access to care and reducing those wait times. We thought that it certainly considered patient affordability. It does incorporate the strategic planning initiatives that were set forth by our board, um, who is committed to providing high quality health care. And we continue to have a focus on the organization's financial sustainability. It does include cost savings, as you heard me outline, as well as operational efficiencies. And it does allow us to make some critical investments in our facilities and equipment and really strives to meet the, the needs of the patients that we're serving. And just to wrap up, um, acknowledging that um, we might be discussing our FY23 performance today, we wanted to highlight some of the reasons that our net revenue uh, surpassed expectations in 2023. Again, um, improving access to care, a reasonable portion of that overrun that we had in FY23 is related to patient seeking services outside our HSA. It was about 24% over FY 2022. Um, and again, those patients are seeking orthopedic and imaging services in particular. RED did experience an increase in volume. That was a result of reduced access to primary care within Rutland. Um, this still is a persistent challenge for us as of current state. Um, and then lastly, we did introduce some new pharmaceutical treatments, which comprise a considerable amount of that increase. And I think that ends the presentation portion of our hearing. Um, and Chair Foster, I will turn it to you. Thank you. You guys have done the best on timing so far, and we really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, I'll open up to the board members for any questions they have. Sure. I'll. Oh, Robin, did you want to go? Okay. You go. You go ahead, and I'll jump in next. How about that? Okay. I'm more comfortable when it's the other way. But um, so thank you for the. Um, team from, from Rutland. Um, I really want to start off by commending the progress you've made to stabilize. Um, in the three years that I've been um, involved with the board, I've really been able to see that progress. And I've also seen um, your responsiveness to our feedback 
um, in prior budget reviews. Um, I listened, I read all the documents, um, and from the presentation today, um, I really thought um, I should also commend your efforts to reduce the cost per adjusted discharge. And the reduction in administrative costs with the Wang and Bai analysis, um, I was very pleased to see that. And just your willingness to work with us to prioritize benchmarking variables for your organization. Um, I, I thought that the way you said that was um, very welcoming. Um, and you'll realize that those priorities will change for each hospital. And so we're in the process of, of gathering our data and learning how to look at that. A another place that I wanted to commend your efforts um, in your narrative on page 16, you talked about community benefit. Um, and uh, you also showed in the diagram of data sources that you're familiar with the Lown Institute's um, fair share spending data. Um, and I just want to call out that um, RRMC is one of only two hospitals to be um, providing more community benefit than they receive in tax benefits. Um, so I think you should be applauded for those efforts. Um, you described your community needs assessment um, also in the narrative and the four focus areas of, of housing, mental health care, care for aging concerns, and child care and parenting were the four kind of buckets that you, you talked about. Some of those are beyond your control clinically, right? I, I understand that. Um, in your narrative, you explained your 6.1% NPR as being driven by utilization and needs. Um, and you go on to specify that outpatient services, lab volume, diagnostic imaging, pharmacy, and endoscopy are the drivers. Um, would you please um, describe for me how increases in those services are related to the needs you identified in your community assessment? Take that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take. I'll take a shot at that. This is Judy. Um, so our community needs assessment um, is really uh, a planning process that includes all of our community partners here, um, and there is a decision that has to be made uh, for the implementation of any initiatives that come out of that community health needs assessment. There are a couple of pathways that um, we take to try to respond to some of those needs. Uh, there's the first consideration as to what should Rutland Regional Medical Center do. So if you looked at our strategic plan, um, in particular, uh, we, the detail within our employer of choice plan, we are considering a play in both housing and making um, and trying to decide where Rutland needs to support um, our community and quite frankly, our staff. And you see that as a significant um, value to both with, uh, recruitment and retention. Just last week, we had an author out to a diagnostic imaging uh, therapist uh, who had accepted our offer, came to um, our community, and later turned down the offer because of lack of housing. So it's real. And, um, and so you'll see that our strategic plan, happy to provide it in detail, uh, really speaks to those pieces of community health needs assessment that we think as Rutland Regional Medical Center, we should lead. Um, in addition to that, and, and included in our narrative, we do have funding through our BAUS Health Trust. And so using our community health needs assessment, if we believe there are uh, uh, needs within our community that we shouldn't lead, but maybe we can provide some seed money or funding, we do um, connect to uh, about $300,000, $325,000 a year that we provide to our community partners uh, specifically to respond to some of these needs coming uh, through the health needs assessment. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and similarly with your, um, the 2023, um, the actual NPR, exceeded the board approved NPR by, um, if I remember from Chair Foster's le letter 
about 3.5%. Um, in your letter explaining that from June 12th, you reported that a large portion of the overage was due to increased utilization. And you, you broke that down into service line and the pharmacy service line um, had the highest variance at around $16 million. The next variance, the next highest amount of variance at 8.4 million was other. And I'm wondering if you could help me understand what the other service line might contain and how that would relate to community needs. So there are hundreds of services that we provide um, that in aggregate make up that total. Uh, we do have a threshold in terms of uh, where we think there's materiality in reporting. Um, Jen, are you, can you offer any detail? Yeah, so there were several other service lines um, endoscopy, imaging, um, substance abuse treatment, orthopedics, cardiology is another one. Um, general surgery was one other area that we had. Um, just seeing if there was any other ones that I'm missing here, but I think that may capture um, what may be driving some of that other category. Uh, one other worth mentioning probably is, um, uh, no, I think I got it. I think that would be it. That, that's helpful. I, I think um, I've I've watched how you all have you know paid attention to our questions in the past, and um, so I, I I imagine you can see what I'm trying to do here is is that some overage in utilization would could be welcome if it was directed toward a specific community need, right? If if and we see over and over again that mental health comes up. Um, but we don't often see big changes in mental health, the mental health component of a budget. And so what I'm trying to just do is, is see where um, see where the dollars are flowing and if they're flowing toward um, community need. Um, so th thank you for your answers with that. And I, I trust you understand what I'm trying to do and, and can help us out. Um, in your so, so if, if I oh, could just respond. Um, please do, yeah. Community health needs assessment. We really look and track at wait times. And so we're using that wait time information to make informed decisions as to where we should um, offer expanded or increased services um, and, and using that um, as, as kind of a foundation for our budget. I will tell you in terms of our a position in behavioral health and mental health um, outside of having a strong relationship with our designated agency here in our community. We do offer outpatient behavioral health services. Um, we have an inpatient, as you know, psychiatric service, both um, a, a medical unit and what we call our intensive care unit that we manage for the state of Vermont. And we manage um, an opiate addiction center where we treat about 300 patients a day. In um, our behavioral health, um, space. I'm really happy to report that um, within the next uh, few weeks, we have added two advanced practice providers to our behavioral health um, provider uh, contingent to allow us to respond to some of those big times. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, so also, in your presentation, um, you listed the several several data sources. The Lown Institute was there. The RAND data were also there. And when I was um, looking at that data and looking specifically at, um, uh, at Rutland, um, your total facility price is listed at about 303% of Medicare, um, while the state average is 298%, and the national average is 269. Um, that state average of 298 is kind of in, in inflated higher than it would be um, because of the largest hospital in the state being quite a bit higher. Um, how, how do you interpret those data? What do they mean to you? And what type of action might you take because of those data? Well, 
And I, I look, took a look a little deeper into the RAN data, frankly, and I found it interesting that on the outpatient side, I think the percentages are are something that looking further into it and analyzing it is we notice that in outpatient, we are the third lowest reimbursed in rural hospitals for Medicare um, mm -hmm. for the outpatient. Uh, book of business and on the inpatient side. So that's going to increase that percentage, of course. Yeah. And then for the inpatient side, um, I noticed that some of my peers were anywhere from two to 8% um, better paid by Medicare than our RMC. And mm -hmm. so what we've taken away from that data now is just going back to the table and really trying to analyze what is it that, what are the mechanisms in that differentiation between what we're seeing in the peers and what we're doing and how we're looking at that as part of our cost report filing, could be the wage index, um, could be differences in base year. So there's many factors as we know that could go into that, but it was interesting to see just the differences and on the outpatient side being the third lo lowest in rural, it was it was eye-opening. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate having this this dialogue because that helps with another, another feature. Um, you know the um, the three hundred and three percent of Medicare for the total facility. Um, the your break even percentage is only about eleven percent less, and the gap between the the commercial price you're receiving and the break even that the size of that gap is considered a measure of efficiency, and eleven percent is small, meaning you're highly efficient. In that data, but the the overall um, the break even number being way over um, 250 percent doesn't quite jive with the rest of the country and the rest of the state, where the the average is around 120. Um, so I think continuing to dive into that data and learn from it and share with us your interpretation, and we share with you ours. I think we can learn a lot from it and and um, go from there. Um, Rand also has some quality metrics. Um, they're organized by Quantros, and in those um, measures, um, RMC is in the bottom quartile. And I I wondered how you interpret that information. If you're used to those. Um, that data set by Quantros on reliability and safety, um, and just how you interpret uh, that information. Um, so we've been looking at our uh, CMS and Care Compare and Loan Institute data, um, and we do see where we have opportunity, uh, particularly around inpatient mortality. Um, we had a kind of a, a pop uh, in. 2022, and so um, working very quickly with multidisciplinary teams to address that, we've already seen significant improvement, uh, specifically in that metric, um, since um, July of last year, um, and have maintained that significant improvement since. Um, so definitely looking at a variety of data sets um, and um, taking that data very seriously and hoping to improve and get back to where Rutland Regional um, has set an expectation to be. Great, um, I appreciate that response. And and um, with the with the quality data, similar to the community needs assessment, and then the budget, um, th what I'm trying to do as one board member with my own thinking, if uh, we have a request that exceeds guidance, but I can tie it directly to we're using this, the dollars where we've exceeded guidance toward this community benefit or to address this quality concern, um, that's more reassuring to me, if you understand. Right. So um, I'd like to turn to the profit and loss statement. Um, under the gross patient care revenue, there's a category titled deductions from revenue, um, which totals $635 million. Um, could you give me some more detail into what goes into that category and why that number is so big? 
Yeah, so the deductions from revenue are the contractual adjust. There's several things that go into that number, but the primary source of that is our contractual adjustments. So you heard me say, um, if, for example, our charge is $100, um, we get a contracted payment of, let's say, 90% of that $100, we're going to have a contractual there is a patient portion related to that, but just for simple math, that $10 is going to go into that particular line item. Okay. Um, administrative write-offs will particularly go into that line item as well, but it's all those contractual adjustments that are the primary driver of that uh, discounts or uh, deductions from revenue line. Got it, thank you very much. How often do you renegotiate those contracts? Um, typically, the conversations occur annually um, with the commercial payers. We don't have the negotiation ability, obviously, with the government payers. Um, but with the commercial payers, um, it's typically on an annual basis, dependent on the payer. Okay. Got it. Um, I'm glad to hear that rather than it being like a three year contract. Um, so the, the, la the last bit, that um, I, I'll be doing this with every hospital that I that I do a deep dive on. Um, what would be the most reassuring to me is when you're asking to go beyond guidance, that you have we have a better sense of how that's going to address community need, how that's going to address quality concerns. And the way that would be most reassuring is if we saw specific priorities with objectives and key performance indicators. And I liked very much the, the five pillars and the 12 strategies. And, and if it, what would be even stronger is if those tied into the community needs and, and quality concerns. So we could see that that's right where the, the funding is going. Um, and, and finally, one thing I've learned from my fellow board members with questions earlier today, um, with a, is we've been inquiring more about productivity and with mental health services, behavioral health services for mental health needs, for example, um, that's a large community need, similar with substance use disorder care. And what I'm trying to get a sense of is the productivity of the care teams that are, are doing that type of treatment and whether there's room for improved productivity to meet the community need or will it does it require more staffing? And I understand that it, the answer is gonna be both, but I'd like to understand that more deeply. Does, did I do okay explaining that? So, so to go back, I think to the point of your first question sets, you know, our strategic plan um, is, is quite detailed. And in my opening address, you heard me talk about success measures. And so within our um, access to care strategy, uh, we have a number of success measures that are linked to patient need um, and, and as defined by some wait times. We are tracking and expect to improve on clinic wait times, on imaging wait times, um, time it takes to get into an OR, and the uh, time it takes uh, for um, uh, endoscopic care are, are, are some examples. And our budget um, is clearly reflective of those goals and those strategies that we have in place that we feel we have an opportunity to address in 2025. Now, there are some other issues uh, that we think we need to address that we need further partnership with you. We'll be submitting a certificate of need uh, to address some other wait times. Within our quality, same piece um, is that we have a number of success measures within quality um, that look at patient satisfaction, looks at a, a quality dashboard that has um, uh, hundreds of different metrics that um, our service lines are looking at. Our quality committee of our board is engaged every month with um, we're looking at event uh, reporting, um, health needs assessments, all of those success measures, if you will, within that quality um, 
uh, se sector and strategy. So I think if you saw those pieces of work, you would see how we're trying to integrate all of these uh, needs and information and come up with a budget that balances access, cost, affordability. Um, thank you for that response. You mentioned earlier that you'd, you'd share that strategic document. If you did, I would read it. And, and I just want to um, thank you for the presentation. I, I know it's a lot of work to get all this together. Thank you for answering my question. Nobody likes to have to answer questions on television. Um, and just thanks for all the work you're doing to care for your community. Um, I can, I see the effort and um, want to commend you for it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go ahead. Um, hi, nice to see everyone. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I want to. I have a a few questions I want to run through. I'm going to start with some questions I had from the narrative. I think they'll be fairly quick. Um, on, and you touched on this a little bit in in your slides on slide 15. Um, on page 13 of the narrative, you highlighted that one of the commercial categories. Um, is military insurance, which is of course a government payer that doesn't negotiate. Um, I was surprised to see that it was about 34% of your commercial category. I don't think that's typical. I'm wondering if um, there's any sort of additional information you could provide about why that might be. Yes, I should have been a little bit more clear on that, honestly, Robin. It's 34% of our all other commercial category. Oh, okay. That makes a lot I apologize more sense. for that. Yes. No worries. And I was like, wow, is there some, <laughs> is there a base there that I've never heard of? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, on uh, page 15 in your narrative, um, you provided some information about the Medicaid redeterminations that was very helpful. Um, and you noted that you've observed 12% of patients move off of Medicaid coverage into either, I assume by self-pay is our polite way of saying uninsured or uh, commercial insurance. Um, it could, do you have any sense of like what that breakdown is? Between the two buckets? Yes. Uh, not off the top of my head, but we can certainly submit that to you. Yeah, I was just curious if, you know, uh, should we be worried about vastly growing uninsured or or most people managing to make it into a commercial bucket? So that was was really what was behind that question. We can certainly follow up. Thank you. Um, on page 17 of your narrative, when you're discussing the risks, um, you mentioned that you're focusing on decreasing the variable cost structure um, because of unpredictable changes in volume. And I can sort of theoretically understand what that might mean, but as a practical matter, what does that mean? <laughs> So we, we staffed a census. And so in the last um, several months, frankly, inpatient census has certainly been fluctuating downward. Um, when we see upward fluctuations, we adjust our staffing and we use our premier benchmarking tool also to manage um, our labor and um, address the balancing, if you will, with the census that we have in house. And so that's really what we were getting at there, Robin, honestly, is that we do staff to the census and we'll fluctuate. If our census is down, we're going to fluctuate down. If we're up, obviously we're going to fluctuate up. Got it. Okay. And, thank you. and just as reference, I mean, we, you know, most hospitals are a fixed shop. Our fixed um, costs are around 70%. So our variable costs are around 30% because we can't fluctuate in the ED or OB services, as you can imagine, but on those uh, medical units and the surgical unit, we can do that. Okay, yep. Thank you. On just one moment. <laughs> Uh, I this is just a comment. Um, I I did notice that your patient boarding information was significantly more 
detailed and nuanced than what we've seen from other hospitals. And I really appreciated that. I think it helped to have a better understanding of what, what you're seeing there. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Okay, um, so the main area that I wanted to focus more on is related both to the 6.1% NPR increase as well as the 23 budget variance. Um, it seems like we're seeing a, a theme here in your budget of in 23, there's some increases in utilization uh, that looks like it's carrying forward into 24, both because you used your projected 23 for 24, but then also 24 looks like it's running slightly hot and then carrying forward yet again into 25. Um, and, and so I appreciate it in your slides, really connecting that for some of the areas back to uh, wait time. So I think my general question is, um, I understand that you're seeing increased demand. How do you measure increased demand? And do you have data that can support that more specifically for the areas that you've outlined? Yes, so we monitor and manage any kind of backlog that we may. You heard me reference that, Robin, when it comes yeah. to endoscopy. I'll be honest, right now, MRI, we're experiencing a backlog of five to six weeks. And so we do track those metrics. And you know, we're happy to share those with you if, if you would like some of those, because our teams are cognizant of what that backlog looks like in those particular areas. Yeah, I think for me personally, it would be helpful to see more specificity connecting um, metrics to the utilization uh, increases. I appreciated um, the information about out of area. Certainly there are some folks um, within easy drive of you who may be having difficulty getting into their local hospital. Um, and so it makes sense, like what you're saying makes intuitive sense to me, but I think having more data around the backlogs and uh, changes in wait times. So if you've seen, if your efforts in 23 have resulted in decreased wait times in 24 or 25, that would be good, I think, to demonstrate. Um, so that we can really see the impact of uh, those increases. Um, given the time, I think if if that's a follow up item, that probably makes the most sense. Um, I think Judy wanted to mention something. Yeah, so, yes, please. So we can certainly do. Judy, you cut out. Uh -uh. Now I'm hearing you. Sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, we still can't hear you. I wonder, now I think you're all muted. So maybe Kelly unmutes and <laughs> Jen mutes. I don't know. <laughs> Go now. How about now? Perfect. Okay. So we do use wait times to track and manage our net patient service revenue. Um, but to be honest, we have seen a greater demand uh, for some services. So it, it doesn't necessarily look like we've improved wait times because we're seeing demand from outside of our service area. Um, when we um, put into place our second CT, um, it became uh, widely known and we started um, getting uh, referrals from outside of our uh, service area for that. Uh, mammography is another great example. Uh, not that we expanded equipment, but we expanded uh, hours of operation. And so uh, seeing a lot of demand uh, ac across the state. So it's, it's, it's not a, a one for one and it requires a lot of consideration and looking at where those patients are coming from and, and how that's impacting wait times. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. That that's very helpful. Oh. All right, let me just check my notes quickly. I'm back. Okay, I think that's uh, what I have. If I find something, I may jump in at the end um, with additional questions, but thank you very much. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster, or whoever wants to go next. 
Um, I, I can go next. Um, just a couple of quick things I wanted to make sure I had right. Um, if you don't have this available, you can just send us an email or something after. But the fiscal year 23 budget order was 313 million. The 23 actuals is about 325. The 24 budget order was 328. And the 24 actuals with the projected 2.5 over is about 336. And then the request for fiscal year 25 is about 356. Do I have that all directionally correct? Directionally correct, yes. And this increased utilization, so the increased utilization is coming from, you said Addison, Windsor County, and it's it's hospital care, obviously. It's coming from other hospitals, is that right? It is. Or what do you attribute patients within or, that HSA? Right. What what do you attribute that to? Well, I think some things that we're experiencing, as you heard us mention, is um, there's more availability. So, for example, in our imaging services, um, and particularly as you heard me say with um, endoscopy or excuse me, um, CT and MRI services. Uh, there's a considerable wait time in some of those communities, and we're able to get those patients in for that care uh, a bit more quickly um, than some of those HSAs. I think from a surgical and orthopedics perspective, we have a reputation um, within our community, and I think that's one of the driving factors from a surgical perspective. Um, Judy, I don't know if you wanted to add any others to that, just as a couple of examples there coming from other HSAs. And as I mentioned in this 24 um, budget year, as well as what we're carrying forward in the 25, or those patients seeking that inpatient psychi uh, psychiatric care as well. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, the, the challenge with access to primary care. Um, we serve as a safety net for our community, including uh, mental health. And so uh, we have a, a significant amount of uh, emergency department volume um, that if we can get primary care, um, you know, access built up, uh, we wouldn't see that volume in our weekly. Do you have a marketing budget? And if so, how much is it? I think it was in our yes. Let me just take a look really quick in our narrative. $642,000. Sorry, 630 something? 642. And is that higher than in fiscal year 24 or 23? Uh, we can look that up for you. Um, I, I will tell you that a third of our marketing uh, relates to um, hosting our website and, and not necessarily true marketing. That's why I might think. Mm -hmm. um, and this question is not to suggest it's wrong or anything like that, but are you advertising in these other HSAs for the services that you're seeing an increase in? For example, imaging or orthopedics in Addison County or Windsor County? So uh, uh, we can get a listing of our recent uh, campaigns. Uh, we use WCAX um, as one of our media. We use the Redmond Herald. Um, we have a slew of social media. So um, if that's of interest, we can see what the campaigns are. But no, they're not specifically targeting. And quite frankly, we can't take care of the patients in our home community. I might have asked a question for are you are you advertising in Addison County and Windsor County? So not not uh, specifically, no. Um, I guess uh, I don't know. Do I, I don't I guess I, I'm not clear on your question. 
We can certainly provide you with our, our advertising campaigns if that's helpful. Yeah, I was just trying to say whether or not you're running any advertising or marketing that is entering uh, Addison County or Windsor County. Okay. To the extent we have something on WCAX, but um, that's that's our local television station. So, right. Okay. Would you like a list of our uh, ad campaigns? Yes, that would be great. Um, and there does seem to be a couple of years consistently of being above um, what you had budgeted in your submission. Can you explain what you think the difficulty is in accurately forecasting uh, the utilization? Uh, I can I can start. Some of it is in the timing of when we start to do these budgets. Um, typically, you're looking at October through February. Um, of the fiscal year prior. So for uh, 2023, we would have been evaluating October through February um, of that year to try to set the budget for 24. Um, and obviously we do our best to look at what the trends are at the current state. We do a two year look back to see what maybe that historical um, trend is looking at. Uh, layer on any new services that we may anticipate. And there are some services we may not anticipate and just need to meet the demand of the community. But that's generally how we go to formulate our budget. And so we try to get it as close as possible based on the information we have at that time. And Judy, I don't know if you wanted to add to that at all. Yeah, the other piece that um, I, I'm, I'm proud to uh, comment on is we had a very successful year last year in recruiting providers. I think we had a recruitment of 21 providers, 21 or 23 um, in, in, in last year. And, and then we have uh, continued that success. I think we've had five new providers join us already this year and another five joining us um, as we speak now within the next few weeks. So um, we didn't necessarily count on being that successful in recruitment. And then from the Bartholomew, I think it's Bartholomew and Nash yesterday, they spoke about Medicare cost coverage. What do you calculate your Medicare cost coverage at? Um, we compared to their 73%. Is that what you're? Yeah, I, I want you're, to know if you, you're what you're comparing. What, yeah, what do you comparing. calculate it at? Uh, you know, we'd have to take a look at that, to be honest with you, and get back to you. Um, not that we disagree with the 73%. Um, we've been certainly trying to dive into those metrics, as you heard me mention. Um, one of the things that we think might be playing into that lower cost is our custodial care. And so we're doing a little bit of a deeper dive on how that's impacting that 73% and the erosion that Bartholomew and Nash has been talking about over the last 10 years. Um, interestingly enough, also, um, just trying to understand the nuances beside behind, um, well, things like the wage index and things of that nature that might impact that percentage as well. Um, and, you know, just focusing on that particular number, we believe is, uh, inpatient only as well. So that custodial care is certainly going to play into that percentage. I appreciated the remarks about trying to manage to Medicare. I think that's going to be very critical for survival of hospitals in the state going forward. It'll be an important goal. Um, can you tell me what you're doing to achieve that and where you are in terms of getting to that level? Well, I think with the AHEAD model, um, one of the opportunities that we highlighted when we made some comments about the AHEAD model um, aligns with the 300 and we're a low cost state, as you know. And so there are some opportunities out there in our negotiation, perhaps to the tune of around $330 million. Um, and so we feel that's a maybe untapped resource, not just for hospitals. We're not here to be, you know, just all that funding going to the hospitals, but certainly to support things 
um, like our designated agencies, home health is one in particular, mental health another, um, but bringing those dollars back into the state, but keeping in mind that for our RMC in 2023, our shortfall, as Judy mentioned earlier, on um, Medicare and Medicaid was $39 million in reimbursement to the costs. And so I think it's important for us to think about what we might be able to do with the AHEAD model um, and bringing some of that funding back into the state. And I, okay. Um, I, I, I'd like to add, in, and um, I know um, um, there was a question uh, around custodial care. So custodial care does play into uh, the cost coverage when we look at some of those metrics. And uh, for uh, Rutland Regional, when we have eight to 10% of our inpatients in this uh, state of custodial care, meaning uh, their, they, their diagnosis so, or um, the medical condition doesn't warrant inpatient care, we don't really we're not reimbursed, but there are true costs for that, and somebody has to pay those bills. And so that does end up in, in cost coverage. And, and we are working with our community partners on our, our long term care um, providers here. We're working with AHS. We even have a, a side agreement with um, Springfield Hospital because they are a swing bed program. So they do have an opportunity to be reimbursed for some patients that we don't have. And so and that is a significant issue that we do need to deal with. And it's not one that Rutland can deal with on our own and would look to uh, partner with the state on it. But that does impact that cost coverage. Yeah, understood. Um, so just going back to my question, aside from whether or not there's $330 million coming from Medicare or not, but for the sake of this question, presume there is not $330 million coming back. How, where are you in your target of trying to manage to Medicare and what steps are you taking to get there? Well, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the last two years, uh, we cut almost $9 million from our budget. Um, that's a discipline that we will continue to have. And it's a discipline that we've built into our strategic plan uh, for sure. Um, and so, you know, we see that as our responsibility and our part. Uh, we see um, providing appropriate access to care. So it's the care that we should be providing while at the same time working with primary care, working with home health, working with mental health um to uh, in long-term care to try to get some of these costs out of our system and i know we have it and it's just not at the tip of my finger but what are you budgeting for a medicaid rate increase for fiscal year 25. zero percent for medicaid and do you recall what the medicaid rate increase was for fiscal year 24. Mm -hmm. oh. I do not off the top of my head, but we can get that if there was one in 24. I don't recall that there was one in 24, um, but if there was, we can certainly get that for you. All right. Um, and I think my last questions um, on the overages for fiscal year 23. Um, is there a temporal aspect to that as in it came in? late or early or kind of continuously throughout the year and maybe that is better answered by the service line with which you have severe um, overages but i'm curious like when and how that came about i'd have to go back and take a look at when the spikes would occur from months the months of spikes i should say within 2023 but we can certainly follow up and provide you with when we started to see spikes in that, those particular service lines. That would be helpful um, for sure. Um, so if you have it by month of what you were forecasted and then what you actually were, that would be really helpful. Um, I don't have anything else, I don't think. Is there anything else that you wanna share um, with regard to the budget overage from 23? I think just highlighting um, 
you know, you've heard us say highlighting that utilization was a big component of um, that total delta between what we had originally budgeted and what our actual performance was. And just mentioning that the reimbursement aspect of that yielded roughly around $620,000. So it wasn't coming from the pricing side of the equation. It was really coming from that utilization increase that we had been seeing. Um, so I just think it's it's important to to highlight those things. And again, 24% of that um, volume that was coming in was from outside of our HSA. And I do think it's important to note um, just one more thing from the emergency room perspective. And I know Dr. Hamery mentioned this too in terms of trajectory over the five the next five years um, to ten years about emergency room services and you know, trying to see a decline there. But for us in our HSA, if our primary care partners continue to close um, panels for the Rutland area, it does drive that volume to our emergency room. And it did that in FY23. Great, thank you. Um, nice to see you all and thanks for your presentation today. Other board members? Dave, unless you wanna go, I'm happy to hop up here. Good. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll just jump in on a couple of things you, that you just said, Jen. Um, I guess one of the areas that I'm interested in learning a little bit more about. So some of the overage came from um, reduced panel sizes in primary care, leading to more ED utilization. Um, some of the you know you you talked a bit about the custodial care, the six million dollars in unreimbursed costs associated with um, custodial care patients. Uh, given the demographics that you have in your community, um, given the, you know, the emphasis in trying to get uh, patients out of the emergency, I mean, out of, well, out of emergency rooms, certainly, and out of hospitals overall. Um, I know, Ms. Fox, you mentioned um, you working with your community partners to try and, and find more long-term care or, you know, address some of the primary care issues that are um, sending patients into the ED. And I'm wondering what the, if you could talk a little bit more about how, what your, I guess I would say your fiscal year 25 budget estimates are if those partnerships work out, right? So if, uh, I'm not asking this very well, but let me ask you this. You've, you've got $6 million budgeted right or uh, estimated right now in costs for custodial care patients. Do you have $6 million estimated for 25 or is there are some of these partnerships and initiatives and attempts to, you know, with Springfield Hospital going to lead to lower costs in fiscal year 25? I'm not able to hear anything. Did you hear my out. question? I'm sorry. It was my question. Yes, your question oh, came through. Okay. It was it was Miss uh, Fox that I. Is anybody else hearing her? Because I'm not. Okay. So, I apologize. Okay. We are having some technical difficulty here. Um, so we can get you the average daily census included in our 2025 budget. I don't have it readily available um, uh, so that you can see the trend right there. To be truthful, um, I don't see this as a short-term uh, success. Um, it's going to take some time. Uh, we are hopeful that uh, the, the um, long-term care center in Bennington uh, will um, will come online, our concern, and, and we have um, a, a handful of patients earmarked for that center, to be truthful. Um, our concern is it's gonna fill up quickly and then uh, we, won't, we won't see the opportunity of open beds because uh, these patients are very long-term patients. So is there any effort, is there any consideration of opening your own primary care practices or opening your own long-term care beds? to try yeah, and alleviate no, this stress? Um, not, not, not in the short term. Um, primary care um, really is advantaged in our community through uh, the structure of a federally qualified healthcare center. 
uh, they have reimbursement opportunities that we as a hospital do not have. And so really looking to partner with primary care. So what do we do there? We do support them in their uh, recruitment um, uh, of their providers. Uh, we actually have an, an agreement with them uh, where our recruiter will work with their team. Um, and we also provide uh, some funding uh, to get and entice uh, primary care physicians to our community. Just is there any interest or in increasing that investment to support that? I mean, I'm just I'm wondering how along that care continuum, um, Rutland Regional can help at the primary care level and help at the long-term care level to alleviate some of the pressure that you're seeing in your EDs and in your custodial care. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, it's additional funding uh, that community health needs um, for uh, physician recruitment. Um, um, and I also want to go on record saying, I don't know that they've reduced their panel sizes. Um, they have had a number of providers, uh, kind of transition in pr providers, but um, I, I've not, and nor do we have access to their panel sizes. So do you want to okay. make that statement on record? Okay. Um, and we do have um, uh, uh, contracts with uh, a, a couple of long-term care facilities um, that we will bear the burden of uh, costs to, if they will accept transfer of these patients as they await a final determination for long-term Medicare. Okay. Um, it's such a struggle, I know. And I don't know how we start to fix some of the pain points in our system. So. Um, I hope the Bennington facility really does help alleviate some of this pressure. Um, in years past, um, when Rutland experienced an overage in NPR uh, due to utilization, uh, past experiences actually, uh, Rutland came in mid-year and oh, basically offered a rate cut. So I'm wondering what, why that didn't happen this time. Yes, yeah, so um, it, it's it's there's there's real costs associated with um, this increase in access. And honestly, if you look at our operating margin, um, as was demonstrated by Oliver Wyman, and you look over the past five years, we're in a very different situation. We're a break-even organization now. We we don't have the operating margins that we had back in 2015 and 16, uh, where we could. Um, look at uh, providing some type of relief from this utilization. Um, we are we are operating on a break-even basis and uh, it would force us into um, an operating loss, quite frankly. Um, another question, I just I found it interesting um, in the narrative, you asked to be held harmless from ACO dues um, as expenses beyond your control. And I just thought that was interesting because I think participation in the ACO is a choice, and I would assume you'd only participate if the benefits exceeded the costs. So I'm assuming the benefits exceed the costs of ACO participation. Is that right? Historically, yes. Um, we have seen that as, <laughs> as a benefit um, in this year's trending. Uh, the one area that is offsetting that expense, frankly, is Patient, attributed patients coming to us from outside our HSA. Um, so, yes, you're correct, but there is a balance to that because we are seeing a downturn in some of those categories of shared savings from the ACO. Um, but what's saving that is serving patient, those attributed patients from outside the HSA, frankly. That's what's been balancing it. Okay. Uh, and then my just my last question was around the uh, you mentioned an increase in the organizational minimum wage. I was just wondering if you could give us a little more detail. What was it and what is it now? It is just over fifteen dollars an hour. We are moving that to sixteen dollars an hour. Um, and then there will be a three percent cost of living on top of that just after we move to the sixteen dollars an hour. It's still tough to be competitive in our surrounding area. And it's it's not just healthcare facilities. Obviously we're competing with um, retail organizations and fast food organizations and things of that nature. And so we're, we're just trying to take some steps to move in the same direction that they're going from a market perspective, but that's what we will be increasing it to. 
Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. And Jessica, if I, if you don't mind, I wanted to just go back to one thing um, that Judy mentioned on your question about the 6.2 million in cost. Um, it, the cost would still remain because we may shift those, if those patients were not in our facility, we would shift those patients to being able to accept acute care patients. Um, and so it's, the cost would still be there. I just wanna clarify that that would still be the case. Um, and did just want to mention that in FY25, we did plan for um, an increase in custodial days. So we are increasing about 713 days over the 24 budget and also um, a 20% increase in length of stay as well. Associated so with the custodial care patients. So in other yeah, words, revenue will be down. There'll be less revenue from acute care patients and costs will be up. And the Community and you know partnerships may, doesn't sound like they're going to really have a significant impact in improving that situation at the moment. Yes. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for taking a few more questions. We're getting near the end of the day here. Um, Jen, can I ask you a question about the Medicare cost reporting? I just want to. I think I may have misconceived of what you were saying, but you said something about being class being classified correctly. And I was just curious if you were referring to Rutland being classified correctly or filling out the report such that items were classified correctly. Well, I think the classification of category, it was more the wing and by classifications of the admin in general, um, I think is what I was kind of getting at there. Um, and how we would treat things as mixed versus um, clinical versus administrative in that exercise um, and how those categories. So no matter which way we looked at the categories, whether it was how we defined it or how Wing and Bai defined it, it was still showing that our costs were coming down. Okay. And then I guess the, the, the next sort of question I had on Medicare was something you'd mentioned with regards to looking to, at RAND is that you have really low Medicare reimbursements compared to pure rural hospitals. And so I um, I wish I knew more, and maybe, maybe I will know more after this about Medicare additional payments, but is Rutland um, able, does Rutland get any additional payments from Medicare for its rurality or for any other um, unique features? We are sole community hospitals, so we do receive um, that settlement process for the cost report. Um, so there is that aspect to it. Um, there are, which is 7.1%, by the way, on outpatient. Um, but also there are other nuances on the cost reporting side from a PPS standpoint um, with regard to the wage index. Um, that is one area as well, because you can, I think you heard that earlier this morning, you can actually reclassify between rural and urban um, in terms of what might look better uh, in terms of the wage index comparisons. And so that is another area that you could explore and what we might be looking into in terms of trying to level set that payment amount. Okay. But the enhanced payment is really on the sole community. Okay. That was good. That was my follow-up question is if you explored, but I wasn't sure if you, who, I couldn't remember who was and who was not sole community in Vermont. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. As, I mean, I think as you can understand, uh, you know, you talk about $39 million of losses in Medicare. We talk about being a low cost Medicare state, but if we're a low cost Medicare state, cause we're not maximizing our reimbursements, then we're a high cost shift state. And we do see some evidence of that. So, you know, of high commercial pay um, and low commercial pay, so low Medicare pay. So uh, encouraged to explore that as much as possible. Um, I just want to ask a little bit about the, the, the excess revenue also in FY23. And so, and just to clarify, my, my, it appears to me that the big revenue generators were utilization for CT, utilization of orthopedic procedures, uh, maybe some cardiology, I assume that's some echocardiography or something like that. And then the infusion utilization, is that is that sort of the big 
positive are those the big positive revenue drivers there yes and and on the pharmacy side just to clarify it was really monoclonal antibody treatments uh for oncology in particular um on the pharmacy side that was driving that particular line item up considerably okay and so my understanding you know and i did look at rand uh, as, as well for rutland there's a breakout if you've downloaded the excel file and spent lots of time staring at it there's a breakout for outpatient prices and in that actually has a uh imaging ct mri imaging and rutland has pretty pretty robust pricing on that uh for outpatient imaging so i would think that high ct utilization is a fairly high margin activity for for rutland yes I, I would I would say yes that that is a fair statement. I did not go into that level of detail for the rand. Really focused on that higher level of detail, honestly, between inpatient and outpatient, um, and focused on those two particular categories. I will say, you know, in some of our past, in terms of the pricing strategies, um, when we look at the 50th percentile of benchmarking and price transparency that had been an area that we had worked on um, to increase and and bring up closer to our peers and closer to market in that particular service line um, but i think in this particular budget we were very cautious of that which is why we kept um, those increases to the 3.4 percent and then uh, additionally, in, in RAND, in the executive summary of RAND, it discussed about hospital administered uh, medications having very high uh, prices compared to the standardized price, the MSP, I think it was the price. And so I, I would imagine those monoclonal antibodies are a high margin service as well. Well, unfortunately, we do not track margin by pharmacy drug or J code, as we would call it. Um, it would really be at the aggregate level. Um, so that would be a little bit difficult to try to peel back the layer of that particular drug, I should say. We do know that oncology drugs are more expensive drugs um, in general. And so obviously we would expect to see that, but from a line by line perspective, it would be not something that we can view in terms of the cost and payment um, for, or excuse me, the payment for each individual drug, I should say. And then orthopedic care is also generally thought of, I believe, as a fairly high margin service. So it does. It seems, it does. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so it appears that the excess revenue is really driven by uh, high utilization and high margin services. Those are high margin services, but it's worth mentioning that those offset some of the other services that we do uh, yep. provide in the community, as you can imagine, especially um, for RMC. You heard uh, Judy say that we do not employ primary care here in Rutland, but we do provide primary care type services. So some of those increases that we might experience in those particular service lines are helping to offset the services such as uh, medication assistance and substance use, the mental health and behavioral health services that we have here. Um, we also do provide endocrinology, that's another area, uh, diabetic care obviously, and then um, OBGYN care services, those could also be done under, uh, you know, a primary care um, scope for an FQHC, and we do provide those ser services here in our community. So it is a balancing act for every hospital when it comes to those higher services, but also meeting community need for those mental health services, et cetera. Yeah, and that's, that's why there's not a, there's not the same margin as those uh, across the board. Correct. And in fact, we all know that those services, um, we we refer to them as operating investments because those services are operating below the revenues. Um, the costs exceed the revenues for those services. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Uh, like last year, just a, a really well-written submission. I just want to acknowledge that. And uh, so thank you so much. And thanks for, for presenting today. 
one follow, how long have you been a Salt Community Hospital? 2009. Okay, um, any questions from the healthcare advocate? I missed one question I had, but I can wait for the HCA if you'd like to. Uh, go, no, go, 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 go ahead, ahead. Robin. I, I, hopefully it'll be quick. Um, in on slide 39, you outlined the increased FTEs for fiscal year 25. Um, and I remember from your narrative that the general surgery, surgery and OBGYN were vacancies that were open from, I think it was 12 to 18 months. In terms of those other, I think it's eight, uh, are, were those vacancies or new net new positions? Um, the the behavioral health APPs that we have listed, those are net new. Um, the CT would be new to obviously accommodate the second CT scanner that we were bringing on. Um, yep. The mobile MRI, the 0.6 that we have for the mobile MRI would be the same to accommodate those new services. The summer intern program, we have had that in our past. Um, we're bringing that back now. Um, so technically, if you look budget to budget, that would be an increase. But if you look at years prior, it would not be because we tried to incorporate that um, into the budgets at that time. Okay. And Thank the clinical. You. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. And the clinical instructor, as you heard, it that is a new position because we are trying to make sure that we can recruit and retain our technologists here. So that one is new. Thanks. Set. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Chair, thank you, board. Um, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate here. Um, I, I, I start by letting the board know that, um, you know, coincidentally, I was at a community meeting last week and had an opportunity to touch base with Judy Fox about our concerns about. Um, some concerns we had about the Act 119 compliance, and that led to a good and I think productive meeting. I hope productive meeting, um, maybe last week, maybe this week. I can't remember. Um, and so I, I don't. Uh, I, I would characterize that as you know our our um, view of Rutland's um, compliance with Act 119 as pretty good, as quite good. There's a number of places where they're doing great. It was one or two concerns that we had, and so I. I I just want to just open it up. I don't know whether Rutland has had an opportunity to consider what we brought to them or whether you're still considering. We are still considering a couple of things, Mike, but there are already a couple of things from your suggestions that are uh, our team is already drafting. Um, right. So we certainly um, took your suggestions um, and, you know, want to incorporate some of those and um, one in particular is really reevaluating the asset test um, yeah. process. And also the other piece of it is, um, you know, making sure that we have more clarity and simplification in the application as well. And so those were two that we really um, took to heart. I think I can't remember now either if it was uh, this week or last week, but, um, you know, I think it was toward the end of last week. But um, thank you for that. By the way, we really appreciate the collaboration and we we've taken those and are already adjusting some of the documents there so that we can repost them. Very good. Thank those you. suggestions. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I want to recognize Rutland as being in the lead of Vermont hospitals with regard to the ratio of bad debt to free care um, for in, in 2023 for um, uh, for every dollar of free care you uh, had a dollar 70 of uh, bad debt that's pretty darn good um, maybe third in the state, but in that top group, and and it's not. Uh, and I also want to recognize that uh, that that's not a new thing. You've had pretty good numbers uh, going back a few years, um, and you're projecting a similar number next year. Uh, I'm sorry for 25. Um, I guess I wanted to just pause for a minute and say why we care about this so much. And this, I'm saying it in the context of Rutland. Um, but it's it's really a statewide comment. Um, 
you, you know, medical debt is is a, an angle on affordability, a subset of affordability. Um, and from our experience, uh, when we talk to people out in the community who are experiencing medical debt, um, it, it is a primary reason given for not getting care. I already owe my provider $10,000. I'm working at paying it off. I can't go back. And so um, I just wanted to say that really clearly. That's why we're staring at this and, and interested in this ratio, because it seems like a natural and obvious place to reduce medical debt and therefore increase access to care. Um, Robin, I had I had the exact same question as member Lunge about um, uh, the 12 percent reduction in Medicaid. And um, and I guess, I guess just further thoughts on that. I, it, it led me to do just a little bit of math. You know, there were a little bit over 200,207, I think, or 8,000 people on Medicaid before redetermination and 24,000-ish came off. So 12% is actually right on for the statewide number. Um, I'm also very curious about your perspective, if you know about where they went, um, Medicaid uh, Vermont Health Connect has some insights as to where people went. Of course, if they went to a QHP, we know where they went. But if I'm sorry, if they went to a, in the individual market, we know where they went. But um, there's plenty of employer sponsored opportunities where we can't track them. Um, and then lastly, just to remind the group, um, we are going to do a household survey. We, the state, it, are going to do a household health insurance survey this fall. It has been postponed a little bit, my, but my understanding is that it's happening this fall, and that's where I hope to get a much more complete answer as to the lay of the land for just where people are going. But I would, uh, like Member Lund, very interested in knowing what, gaining whatever information you have about um, where your patients are have moved when they've moved off of Medicaid. And I think that's it, Mr. Chair. Hmm? We will definitely follow up for both of you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, I think that's all we have for Rutland. Um, we appreciate you coming in and for the presentation, answering the questions and for providing us the follow up. Um, you're welcome to stick around or not. I'm just going to take public comment if we have any and then new business and old business, but you're welcome to enjoy your evening as well. Um, any public comment via the raise the hand function? I usually love public comment, but I'm not going to complain if there isn't any tonight. All right. Any new business or old business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.